Good morning, everybody. Everybody has different uh, customs for what they say at the Hanukkah candle lighting. Some people just say the bracha and they sing the song Ma'oz Tzur. Some people say the whole um, 15 minute Hasidic, all the Tehillims and all the uh, Anabakalaks. It's a whole long thing that you say. That's what we, what we say. All of the different, um, there's, there's three Prakim of Tehillim and then there's another song and then there's another song. There's a lot to say by the, by the Hanukkah candles. And of course we know that women have a special halacha that when the Hanukkah, for the half an hour that the Hanukkah candles are burning, we sit by the candles, we don't leave, we sit there and we pray. We dive in and we ask Hashem for everything that we want. Um, and so that's the custom. When we look at the candles, we look at the fire of the candles and we know that the fire of the candles is actually purifying our eyes and then our eyes go into our brain. So this is a very excellent brainwashing activity. It washes out your brain from all negativity and from all un-Jewish thoughts. That's what happens when you stare and you look at the fire of the candles uh, while the, for the half an hour that the candles are burning. And it's a very, very strong practice to do. And I would really, really advise everyone to get into the habit. And the thing is though, that the candles, the light, I mean, they're little tiny lights. You all know what Hanukkah candles are, even if you're just lighting candles right through, especially if you're lighting oil, the light itself is very small. But try to look at it straight for half an hour. You're gonna see your eyes are gonna close because your eyes are not just seeing lights, it's seeing the Kedusha, the holiness that's emanating from the, the fire of the Hanukkah candles. So generally you can't stare at them straight for half an hour, it's just too much. You have to relax a little bit. And, but we, we dive in, in front of the candles, we dive in near the candles and we don't do any, we don't do any housework for that half an hour, at least a half an hour. Our candles, of course, stay lit longer. And so as long as you want, but for the first half an hour, you stay by the candles. And so um, the custom became to say different prakim of Tehillim. We're going to learn chapter 30, which is one of the chapters in Tehillim that we say on Hanukkah every night by the candles. Now I will tell you that this is also a chapter of Tehillim, a parak of Tehillim, that our rabbis incorporated into the Siddur itself. So we say it every single day. And in fact, for those of you who understand that there's a difference between going to shul and Ashkenazi shul and going to a svard, nusach svard, I don't mean svardi, I don't mean like Israeli edot hamizrach svardi, but nusach svard, which is, a, which is the way the, the Siddur that the Hasidim used, it's actually very similar to the Nusach of the Sfaradim of the Eidot HaMizra. But anyway, the main way to distinguish between are you in an Ashkenazi shul or a Sfaradi shul is where do they say Where do they say this Perak of Tilim? Do they say it before Hozu or after Hozu? So anyway, this is a famous chapter in Tehillim and we say it every day. If you say the whole city, you say it every single day including Shabbos. So let's learn a little bit of it. It will take us again three weeks for Ezra Hashem to learn it. Uh, now I'm going to tell you that we say it on Chanukah because the third word is Chanukah, right? Mizmor is a song and Shir is a song and Chanukah is Chanukah. Chanukah Tabayit means the inauguration of the Beis HaMikdash and Le David. This was by David. It was given to David in Ruach HaKodesh. It was given to David in um, a spirit of prophecy, a spirit of, of um, divine inspiration. Now again, let's see, I owe somebody this, oh, not from this class. So Mizmor, for those of you who understand these, who, who are into the sphera, Mizmor is a sphera of Givura. Shir is a sphera of Bina. And Mizmor means power. It means, they all, the, all the words mean song. But the word Mizmor means a kind of song that empowers you. And Shir means the kind of song that makes you 
introspective. It helps you to have clarity because the word shir is also the word yashar. And we have the same exact beginning what we learned last week, Miz Moshir Niyam Shabbos. Here we have Miz Moshir Chanukah Sabayis. The only difference is Lid David. This is written by David. Lid David always in Tehillah means by David, except in one. Lishlama, which meant for Shlama. That's, that's chapter 72. Okay, so here's, uh, that's the introductory parak. And a mizmor in general, Rashi says, it means a song with musical accompaniment. Do you know that, um, that in the base of Mikdash, which Be'ez Rat Hashem, I hope to meet you there soon. Amen. I hope we'll meet there soon in the base of Mikdash. And you might be a little bit surprised because in the base of Mikdash, there was music. There was musical instruments. There was a choir. Lahavdil, to make a separation between the holy and the absolutely profane, the, the churches, the Goyim, the Christians, the reason that they put all of their musical instruments into their, into their uh, church service is because they were copying the service in the Beis HaMikdash. And why they put an organ, I don't know, that's the spookiest kind of an instrument, maybe because they want to scare everybody. But that's how it was in the Beis HaMikdash. We had music. And the, those who were in charge of the music were the Levian. The Levian were in charge of the music and they were in charge of the choirs and they had incredible harmonies and they had incredible musical accompaniments. And that whole scene, the music in the Mesa Mikdash was so absolutely profound and inspiring and moving that Chazal tell us that you just needed to hear the music and it would right away like jumpstart you to, to, to do tshuva. You know, everybody knows that when we're in, when we're pressed against the wall, we always try to think of, you know, of reality of what's Olam Hazer, what's this world about, what's the next world about. When we're in situations of perhaps um, um, pressure or difficulty, so we, we get we get back to our, you know, we get back to our roots. And otherwise, all day long we're busy. We're busy. Well, we're all busy doing holy things: cooking, cleaning, getting ready for Shabbos, teaching, being at work, parenting, grandparenting. We're all day long busy. Um, you can, and if you're not so busy, so you can listen to shiurim all day long, between shiurim and music, and then doing the things you need to do in the house. The whole day flies by. And so, but. Um, in the Beit HaMikdash, you didn't need any scary events in your life to be happening to make you want to do tshuva. You just heard the music. And that's why chapter 136, al Naras Bavel, or 137, al Naras Bavel, that talks about how the Babylonians asked us to play music in the, of the Beit HaMikdash, and we refused. And they killed a lot of Levine because of that, and the Levine refused, and they said, we are not going to, we're not going to play holy music in a profane place. Okay, so here, Mizmo Ashir, Chanukah Sabayi Sozavi, we're gonna sing them a song, we're about to sing a song about the Chanukah Sabayi. What does that mean, the Chanukah Sabayi? So Chanukah Sabayi means, when Shlomo HaMelech built the Beis HaMikdash, this is the song that they sang at the opening day. A Chanukah Sabayi, maybe some of you have had in your own home, a Chanukah Sabayi. Whenever a person moves into their own home, then they make a ceremony, especially this father, are very careful about this. They make a ceremony where they gather a minion of men, 10 men, and they read portions from the Zohar, and they read portions of Tehillim and portions of the Chumash, and they say it's Vartorah, someone says Kaddish, there's a meal, and that's to consecrate the home. That's to make the home holy, to elevate the home. If you didn't have it, maybe it's okay because in Chuzlaris, I don't know if they, I know they do make Hanukkah Habayim in Chuzlaris, but you should really be, make a Chanukah Sabayis in your home here in Eretz Yisrael. Be'ezrat Hashem, bless you all. We should all move into our homes here in Eretz Yisrael and make a Chanukah Sabayis party. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, so um, but you all know that King David did not live to see the temple. His son, Shlomo, built it. And his son only became king after David left this world. And so David Hamel uh, composed a chapter of Tehillim based on an event that would happen. He knew this. He knew that this would happen after he died. 
and he made a song, a parak of Zehillim, to, in, to say at the, at, the base of, at the opening ceremony of the base of Mikdash, even though he knew he wouldn't be there. So this, just even saying this parak of Zehillim gives us selflessness, because King David wrote this in a very selfless mode. He wasn't writing it for himself, nor would he ever hear it being played until Mashiach comes. Now when Mashiach comes, David Melch is going to come back, and this is going to be his theme song, one of his theme songs. So they played this um, inauguration, they played this Tarek Tzihilim at the inauguration of the Beis HaMikdash. Actually, until they sang this song, the Beis HaMikdash was not functioning. And, um, and when they sang this song, then the Beis HaMikdash opened up the lights from Hashem came down and the Beis HaMikdash was officially officially functioning, officially operational. So on a certain level, Zavah HaMelch really was the one who opened up the Beis HaMikdash. He was the one who caused Hashem's fire to come down and that fire never left for the whole 410 years of the first Beis HaMikdash. The fire on the Mizbech never left Yerushalayim. Never left the, never left the Beis HaMikdash. Okay. Um, why do we say in a Hanukkah? Not just because the word Hanukkah is here, but because Hanukkah means the inauguration of the third temple. We're very much looking forward to this, this Hanukkah. This Hanukkah, we need lots of miracles. As you know, planet Earth needs lots of miracles. Um, uh, politically, Israel needs lots of miracles. Uh, the land of Israel needs lots of miracles. The government of Israel needs major miracles. The Jews all over the world need many, you need miracles to get here. So we say this because we want Hanukkah to open up miracles into our private life also, not just into our past national life. And so on Hanukkah, please ask Hashem to make miracles in your life. Don't, uh, don't uh, forget to do that. Don't think that Hashem can't make a miracle. He absolutely can, he will. Ask him for miracles. You're allowed to ask for miracles in Chanukah. Chanukah is a time of miracles. Hosebet, Aramimcha Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. The word Aramimcha, the whole parak of, of um, the whole Chanukah is, if you remember, we, can, we say in Al Hanisim, Lahodot or Lahalel. We lahalel means we praise, and lahoto means we thank. We thank Hashem and we praise Him. We thank Hashem and we praise Him. That's the energy of Hanukkah to thank Hashem for the miracles, to relate the miracles, and to praise Him. And you have miracles in your own life. You've already had miracles. Those of you who are blessed with children, every one of those children is a miracle. The fact that you survived to give birth to them is a miracle. Any one of you who's healthy, who's blessed with health, that's a miracle. You know how many tens of thousands of procedures are going on in our body right now that we're totally not aware of, processes. So there's a lot to thank Hashem with, for. So that's the whole Hanukkah is also saying thank you. We don't stop saying thank you. <laughs> now, you're, you might say that we've been saying thank you already for years, meaning... I don't know if you know this, I'm gonna give you a little bit of Jewish culture. So Jewish culture 30 years ago, um, and, and 30 years ago, um, the Jewish culture scene entered into being careful with Shmiras Halashon, speech, power of speech. 30 years ago, maybe even 35 years ago, we began, and, and your teacher, Rebson Heller, was one of the pivots in that. We began to have a, um, during the three weeks and the nine days in the summertime, we began to have the Shmir Talashon campaigns where we would have Shiurim classes on what's permitted to speak, what's not permitted to see, speak, Lashon Hara, what that's all about. That, already, that was our campaign 35 years ago. And it works. Now the Jewish people is very careful with Shmir Talashon. And about 10 or 15 years ago, the rabbis began talking about Emuna. Everybody has to strengthen Amuna, and the rabbis were writing books, Garden of Amuna, all the Amuna books. And now is the thank you, Hashem. Now the culture that we're in now is thank you, Hashem. Everybody's singing that song, thank you, Hashem. And everybody has the, the sticker, the thank you, Hashem sticker. 
And there are people who are into nishma saying, thank you, Hashem. It's all about thank you, Hashem. Why is this? Why is this happening? Because we're all getting ready for all of these important things. We need to, in, we need to integrate this stuff into our being. When Mashiach comes, we have to automatically say, thank you, Hashem. We have to automatically to survive this time, this time of the world history. We need emunah a lot. And to survive, to be worthy, to be able to come to live in the time of Mashiach, we need to be careful with our mouths. Mashiach ben Yosef is also careful with Shemir Salashon. So Hashem has been preparing us. Hashem Yisbarach has been preparing us with all of our rabbis getting the same idea. Let's talk about Shemir Salashon, let's talk about Amunah, let's talk about thank you. Now, these are basic Jewish concepts. It's not like there's a Chiddush here. We've been it's in the Chomish. But it depends on what you're stressing, what you're putting emphasis on. So, for example, when my parents were younger and they were living in America, keeping kosher and, sh and keeping Shabbos, that's what they were just struggling with. That's what they had. That was what they're working on. Were you yes to Shabbos, Shabbos or were you not? Did you have to work on Shabbos, Chas Shabbos? Were you able to be, be Shabbos, Shabbos? Were you able to keep kosher or not? Those were the, those were the focuses 100 years ago in America. And now we, okay, so now we did that. No problem now, it could be shut. Everyone can be Shomer Shabbos. No one's going to fire you for keeping your, your Shabbos. And eating kosher now is the easiest thing in the world, easier than it, it has ever been in planet Earth. Since the creation of the Jewish people, it has never been easier to keep kosher. So again, every generation has its thing. The girls are still struggling with tzniyas. That's a big thing now. It's, it, we, haven't, we haven't worked with that. We haven't worked that one through yet. But Ben's Hashem. Okay, so here this Pasuk is talking about thank you, Hashem. Thank you, but not just thank you. I will uplift you. I will raise you up. I will tell everybody how great you are, Hashem. The word Aramimcha, Miriam, that's the name of the root of Miriam, Ram. Ram means to be picked up. I will, uh, now we don't pick up Hashem, but we, we praise Hashem. Why? Ki dilitani. This is a fabulous word. I, I'm every word, I, 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 maybe it'll take me, it could take me years to teach this parakatil, to learn this parakatil with you, because every word is chosen by Dabba Melech like poetry. Like it's as if Lahavzul, he was playing Scrabble. You know how to, do you have Scrabble in England? You have such a thing, Scrabble. So you know how it is. You want to get, like you have your letters, you want to get the most points. With this parakatil, Dabba Melech is choosing words as if he's like, the, he's choosing the best, best word that he could find to express the idea. So the word Dili Tani means you lifted me up. That's what it means. I'm going to thank you, Hashem, because you lifted me up. The word Dili, a Dili is a pail. In olden days, they would lift, they would dump the pail into the well, an empty pail they would put into the well, lower it down, and then lift it up. So the word dili tiny does not just mean to lift it up. It means Hashem, you lowered me down. You emptied me out. That means you gave me a test. And then you lifted me up and filled me up. That's what the word dili tiny. It means you lifted me only after lowering me. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. You read the You go down before you go up. And so... That's the word dilitani. For those of you English majors here, I have a few. I see on the on the I see a few of you who are writers and incredibly expressive. I'm looking for one from America. I don't see her. I'm annoyed with that. I'm upset. I want to see her here. One of my right, one of my students who's a who's a very famous and very accomplished writer. So to choose the right word is such, and then to get it right, you get such a satisfaction from that. So this word, Dilitani, it contains everything. It contains that you tested me, Hashem. You emptied me like a pail. Then you low and you lowered me down. Then you filled me up and you picked me up. And then, therefore, Hashem, because you raised me. Now, if you just look in the English, it'll just say, you raised me from the depths. That's how the art scroll translates it. In one word, you lowered me into the depths and you picked me up. Tell me, you haven't felt that way in your life? Of course you felt that way in your life. And we don't, we haven't felt that way now Hanukkah time. How in the world, how in the world is planet Earth going to get out of this mess that um, certain people put us into? It's a big mess economically and medically and so much, 
There's so much, so much going on right now. Hashem lowered us, and he's going to pick us up. Same thing with Hanukkah, in the time of Hanukkah. You know, when I never really, really look forward to Hanukkah in my life as much as this year. You know why? We all know the story of Hanukkah in our brain. In other words, we know what happened. The Greeks were here in Israel, and they were the ruling government here. Because after we went to the first exile of Babylonia, so then the Babylonians, that was the first exile, and then the Persians took over, they conquered Babylon, and so they inherited Eretz Israel. And then the Greeks took over the world and they captured the Persians, they took over the Persian world, and so they inherited Eretz Israel. And then the Romans took over the Greeks and then they inherited Eretz Israel. But basically, we were really under, in, in a semi-exile from the very beginning of the destruction of the first temple. But with the Greeks, it was really horrible. Why? Because they really were trying to assimilate us big time. And they were very, very clever, just like people today are so clever. And their, their evil is disguised in slogans and in rhetoric and in um, blatant lies and hidden lies if you read if you you know read the politics going on or don't but there's such it's so low now so that was what was going on in, in the land of israel the greeks were very clever and they were trying to assimilate the jews and they didn't say they said we're not gonna we don't want to hurt you we just want to enlighten you why in the world are you wearing those kind of clothes and why in the world would you mutilate your body and make a bris milah? And why in the world would you, uh, would you uh, think that you're in charge of time and make Rosh Chodesh and make holidays? Why are you having a, a lunar calendar that you choose when the month begins? Like, why are you doing things like that? And they were using logic. The Greek philosophers were using, were trying to outsmart Jews. And they also had an incredibly gigantic army. They had power. So that's exactly what we're in now, ladies. It's exactly what we're in now. Nobody knows what's true, what's not true. Nobody knows how to handle all of the, all of the information that's being sent our way. And we are powerless against the major big organizations that are running this world, basically. And so, and yet the Hanukkah miracle happened and they were able in that small little family of Kohanim were able to kick out the Greeks for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Okay, it wasn't a final redemption, but it was definitely a pause in the assimilation rate of the Jewish people. And the Jews who had remained loyal Jews were finally vindicated and the Jews who had assimilated had an opportunity to do teshuva. Now we're at the very, very end of time. So we know that whatever happens now, whatever big miracles happen now over Hanukkah is going to be permanent because there's no more time left. As you know, it says in the Zohar that the revival of the dead takes 210 years. And the, so if you just subtract 6,000 minus 210 years, the whole world will stay in this capacity as it is now for, for 6,000 years. And we're in the year 5,781 and a half, almost, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a third. And so 210 years is going to take for the entire process of Tchir Samesim to happen. And so we're only a few years, and, and Mashiach has to come, Mashiach ben Yosef has to come, and Mashiach ben Dabba has to come before all of that happens, and the Beis HaMikdash has to be rebuilt. We don't have time. So we remember at the end of the time when people say, oh, they talk about Mashiach for all, we've been talking about Mashiach forever and ever, Oh, it's true, but that was hundreds of years ago. Now we're at the edge, edge, edge of time. Okay, so Hashem, I'm going to say thank you. You tested me and you saved me. Velo simachta Now this is an interesting, an interesting and an added phrase that will make you very happy. And you didn't let my enemies rejoice over me. Why is it going to make us happy? Because each of us feels very guilty when somehow we know that we're right and sometimes we're proven right, and yet we don't get um, reactions from people. And you might think, okay, listen, I'll, you know, I was in an argument with someone and I was right and I was proven right. 
And I don't need the other person to acknowledge it. It's clear that I was right and that's the end of that. David Melch is saying, you know what? It's natural and it's normal for us to want to see our enemies admit that we were correct, that we were right. So you didn't, so in that same parak, in the same pasuk of, I'm gonna lift you, I'm gonna exalt you, I'll praise you, Hashem, because you tested me and you saved me, and you didn't let my enemies see me fail. You didn't let them be happy over me. You didn't let them be rejoice over my failings. That's okay to feel, especially if we're talking about enemies of God. We're not talking necessarily about personal enemies because really all Jews have to be, we all really have to get along with each other. But we're talking about the enemies of Hashem, the enemies of God who do not want to recognize the first myth in the Torah is Pruervu, fill up the world. And they're trying to decimate populations. They're trying to reduce world population. That's the first mitzvah that they're going against God. And in America now, there's terrible, terrible um, abortion laws that are allowing children who are almost born and that are full term to be killed and to be flushed down the toilet. It's terrible. And allowing same-sex marriages Okay, you know what people, what people do privately is their own business and a, a government won't fall because of that. But to legalize immorality is horrifying. Those are the enemies that we're talking about now. We're not talking about, and the enemies who want to destroy the state of Israel, the state of the, in the country of Iran, who's not ashamed to say they want to just blow Israel off the map. <clears throat> and the Europeans and those those in America who agree with that and who say, okay, we'll talk to them, we'll calm them down, we'll make a deal with them. All of those are the enemies of Hashem. They're the enemies of righteousness in this world. Those who are panicking people and closing up economies and making people afraid and fearful. Those are the enemies of Hashem, not just our enemies. So this possible, we want Hashem to relieve us from these enemies and we don't want them to rejoice over us. They don't, we don't want them to feel that they have power over us. The word simachta, all of the words with sameach, is all the, you should always know this, the word simcha is Mashiach, right? All of the letters of sameach is Mashiach, the hey and the yud inter, interchange. Hashem alokai pasakim, Hashem my God, shivati alecha, I'm turning to you, I'm crying out to you. Now the word shivati is also one of those words, it's an amazing word. It means it's, it, like I said, the word dilitani, dilitani means you lowered me and then you picked me up. The word shivati doesn't just mean I called out to you. It means I recognize Hashem that you are the source of my Yeshua. Yeshua means my salvation, my help. So I'm only turning to God to help me because I recognize that he is the only source of help in this world, in the universe, in eternity, in creation, in being. So again, the word shivati, it means Yeshua. It means I'm turning to you for Yeshua. But not because, you could also say, he's palalti, I prayed to you. But shivati means I'm acknowledging that my help and salvation only comes from Hashem. So the word, let's say, for example, we have that pasuk in Kuf Chaf Aleph, Ezri Me'im Hashem, right? My help comes from Hashem. Shila Malad Esa'ina, you know, that my heart. My help comes from God. But the word Ezri isn't also a verb. Here, the word Shivati means you're my help. And I'm also calling out to you to help me. It's a verb and a noun. That's why these words are so precious. Zavamel hit the jackpot, choosing words in this parak of Tilim. I mean, that's ridiculous for me to say, because every parak of Tilim is hit the jackpot. But you know what I mean. Here you can really darshan, you can really learn every single word here. So Hashem Elokai, the two aspects of God, Yud Kei Vav Kei is the aspect of God as he appears to us in mercy and compassion. And Elokim is when Hashem appears to us in judgment. And when we say Hashem Elokim, we're, we're talking about the entirety of how a human being can relate to Hashem. And I'm turning to you, Hashem. 
and vatir pa'eni, and you not just not just that you're helping me from the word Yeshua, but you're healing me. Vatir pa'eni from the word Rifua, you're healing me. I turn to you. You're the source of my help, and you're healing me. Okay, now we're going to learn another rule in Tehillim. The other rule in Tehillim is that a lot of times David HaMelech says a word, says something as if it happened. It didn't happen yet. He's calling out to Hashem to help him. Shivati Alecha, I'm calling to you, Vatir Pa'eni, that you should heal me, but the word you should heal me is also, and you healed me. So in Tehillim, David HaMelech is always Whenever he says a word that's in the future tense, it means you should, you did, it happened already. I believe as soon as I say these words, I am totally healed, permanently healed. Vatir pa'eni, you healed me. I called out to you, you healed me. Now, before I forget, Chanukah, one of the many things that our sages tell us about Chanukah is that the um, just like the matzah on Pesach is medicine, the fire of Hanukkah is also medicine. It heals us. Hanukkah itself is a healing holiday. You're, you should dive in for healing strongly, strongly on Hanukkah. Of course, healing for yourselves, your families, the whole Jewish people, and ultimately the whole entire world. Because what's the source of all illness? The source of all illness is in the mind. Of course, it's physicality. It manifests in the body. But the source of illness is something wrong in the mind. Whether it's a thought, whether it's a, a mistake a person made, that's the source. And I'm not talking about, let's say, things that are not in our control. But a lot of times when a person gets sick, it's because, think about it, when is your resistance low? When is your immune system weaker? When you're feeling sad, when you're feeling disappointed, when you're feeling stretched, stretched or stressed, your, your immune system is low. And all of those are feelings in the mind and they also affect the body. It's a very, of course, it's a very generalized statement I just made and it doesn't contain everything. But in general, Hanukkah is a very strong time for dominating for healing because Hanukkah is a time of hope against hope. Hope against hope. Right now on planet Earth, it does not seem to be a way out. But I remember saying this also years ago about the Arabs, about the situation with the Arabs. I remember saying years ago, I said it in Shiur, this Der HaTeva, there's no way out for Israel and the and the, and the conflict between Israel and the, and the Palestinians and Israel and the Arabs. And look what Hashem did. Hashem laughed and said, oh, Rachel, you think there's no way out? Watch. And then Hashem brings President Trump. And President Trump says he has no patience for all of the stuff that's going on, all of this past stuff that's been going on in the Middle East. And he says, okay, enough of that. Let's make peace with who wants to make peace. And now we have all these Arab countries who are standing in line trying to make, make peace with Israel. And then Netanyahu goes to Saudi Arabia. Who ever heard of such a thing? If you would have told me years ago that the, I, I said I would have said we, we need Mashiach because without Mashiach, there's no way that the Middle East is not going to explode. And Hashem said, "Okay, watch. I can bring Mashiach. I can bring the peace in the Middle East without having to without having to resort to super miracles, just semi miracles, miracles within nature." By the way. There, the view in the view in Chabad, in the teachings of the Rebbe of Chabad, he holds that it's actually a higher miracle when Hashem does miracles using nature than if Hashem does miracles using not nature, above nature. The Rebbe from Chabad holds that, let's say the 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 um, holiday of Purim, which was Hashem helped us using the natural means of government and bribery and all that kind of stuff, the holiday of Purim is superior to, let's say, the splitting of the Red Sea, which was a complete miracle. Because the holiday of Purim, I didn't have to, he was able to use nature and, and, and manipulate nature instead of overriding nature. That's the teaching of Chabad. 
Okay, so Hashem, you healed me. You're going to dab him for healing on Purim, on Hanukkah. Um, whenever a person takes any medicine or any vitamins or does anything healing, even if you're just going to take a walk, even if you're just going to sit in the sunshine, if you're doing that for healing purposes, so we say a little prayer that I like to share with you. And the prayer is, Yehi Ratzon, let it be your will. We don't say Hashem's name, we just say Yehi Ratzon. Sheyehei, that it should be. Eisegze li lirafua, that whatever it is that I'm doing right now should be healing for me. Yehi Ratzon, some say Yehi Ratzon lufanecha, Hashem elokeinu. Some say with Hashem's name. But Yehi Ratzon, let it be your will, Hashem that whatever it is that I'm doing should be healing for me. This, whatever it is that I'm doing should be enough hishtadlus, enough effort that I'm making that you should use that to heal me. That's what we say whenever we, whenever we um, take medicine or whenever we do anything that could be our, our effort to feel better. So Hashem is gonna heal us. Hashem will heal, heal our mind. Once Hashem heals our mind, Hashem will heal the body, then Hashem will heal the world and the environment. You know, here in Eretz Israel, we used to have something called uh, uh, recycling. We had a recycling container. It, was a, it lasted for a very short time, sadly, that they don't recycle here. And I remember years ago, I don't know, maybe 40 or 30 years ago, when the company called Keter, the Israeli plastic company, Israel was so proud of our industry of plastics. We became like the capital of plastics of the world. And we were so proud of them. And now, of course, we all know that plastic is not good for the environment. And the plastics have messed up a lot of things. So have we shut down the plastic companies? No, why? because they make a lot of money. So that's the, kind of a, uh, that's the kind of a mindset that needs to be healed. Just like our bodies need to be healed and our minds need to be healed. It's okay, Judy. Then, um, but also when we heal our minds, we'll realize that money does not make the world go round. And the things that we're doing to make money in planet Earth that are hurting planet Earth, we're gonna have to figure out another way to do it. So the whole world will be healed eventually, once the mind is healed, once money becomes meaningless and not a status symbol, once people became, become satisfied, then everything will be healed. It will be a process. It will be a natural process. Okay. Last pasuk of the day. Hashem ha'elita min sha'ol nafshi. Okay, Hashem, you have lifted up my soul from she'ol. This word, this word Shaol is also one of those amazing words. It means hell. That's what it means. But it's not, but it's written in such a word, in such a way that it means the lowest worlds, the worlds of confusion, the world of punishment, the world of horribleness. You lifted my soul from that place. Why is it called Sha'ol? What is it, what, one of the reasons it's called Sha'ol? It's, um, it's, it's, um, it's the grave, it's the lowest place, right? It's called, in the, the Gemaras calls it a bar, a low, uh, like a pit, or Gehenna. So what does it mean you lifted up my soul from this, from this show? What does that mean? Tavon Amalek was alive and he wasn't in, he wasn't in Gehenna, he wasn't in purgatory, he wasn't dead, he wasn't in a grave, he wasn't in a bar. So listen to this. Who do we know whose name sounds like Shaul is Shaul, right? Shaul was Tavon Amalek's father-in-law. He was the first king of the Jewish people, but he was also a source of tremendous pain for King David. 
not because he didn't love him, but because Shaul misunderstood David HaMelech. David HaMelech understood Shaul and he couldn't help him. So remember the story of Shaul HaMelech, he became king, he didn't want to become, he, he was a Mashiach Ben Yosef character. He didn't want to become king. The prophet Shmuel was told by Hashem, find this Shaul, he's going to actually come to you and crown him king of Israel. Shaul was by nature reticent. He wasn't in the, he didn't want to be in the public eye. He was a tzaddik. And um, as soon as he became king, as soon as he was anointed by Shmuel, king, Hashem gave him something called the Ruach of the Melech, the heart and the soul, the spirit of the king. It was an extra spirit of Ruach HaKodesh, of um, divine inspiration. And once Shaul lost his kingship, that divine inspiration was taken away from him and it was given to King David, to David, the young David who had been, who had been anointed king secretly. And Shaul fell into something called a depression, a ruach ra. Now I'm sure that you've learned the book of uh, Shmuel and you know, you, you, saw, you saw that they incorrectly, mistakenly uh, call Shaul's um, uh, ailment um, a depression or a madness. None of that's right at all. All that happened to Shaul is that he had been uplifted for so many years with the Ruach, the spirit of the kingship of Malchus. And then when it was taken away from him, he felt like part of his soul had left him. It's a little bit like what happens most of Shabbos, when people feel like, oh, Shabbos is leaving. Or sometimes it happens like in the month of Tishrei, after Tishrei is over, we're, we're on a spiritual high, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and then it's all over, and then Cheshvan comes, and you know there's nothing to do, and we get sad. Or when Pesach is over, every single Jewish housewife says the same thing. I can't believe Pesach is over. Like it flew by so quickly because we make months of preparation and all of a sudden it's over. And, and also when you make, let's say you make a wedding, you marry off one of your kids and at the wedding, the wedding itself takes four, four or five hours. Nowadays weddings are anyway strange. But when it's all over, you can't believe it. Like all of that effort, and all of that money and all of that, energy and all of that stress and it's over like how can it be and you have a downer you feel down that's how Shaul HaMelech felt and because of that because he was feeling that way his own power of um, making decisions properly was affected by that and so here David HaMelech says Hashem he'elita min Shaul nafshi. You lifted my nefesh up from Shaul. In other words, I have to work hard on being able to survive. Shaul's pursuing me now because David did not ever in the entire time that Shaul was pursuing him and, and angry with him and misreading him and misinterpreting him and misunderstanding him. The entire time, David never lost his love for Shaul. So, but he had to work hard on that. And that's what this is talking about. You, you lifted me up, you lifted my soul up from Shaol, not just from depression or not just from a bad place, but from the difficulty I'm working so hard to keep a positive attitude towards my beloved person in my life. And you could fill in the blank of whoever it is in your life that's you know, long-term driving you crazy. And you're working so hard to be higher than that and not to fall into that. That's what this phrase means. So it's, it's Shaul, it's remembering the story of David and Shaul, it's recognizing that we each have our Shauls in our life, that we have to work very, very hard. Sometimes a whole lifetime, we have to work very, very hard to maintain a positive attitude towards. Also, it means depression. Simple, it means depression. If a person is depressed, say these words. You know that whenever you're sad, whenever you're down, whenever you're feeling weak, whenever you're feeling anything but perfect, if you say a pasuk in Tehillim that's reflecting that, then that's using holy words to reflect your emotions. So if you want to be picked up out of the dumps, if you're feeling low on whatever level, whether it's spiritually low, whether it's lonely, 
whether it's emotionally low, even financially low, whatever you're feeling, health-wise, say these words with Hashem's name. Remember that you're allowed to say a pasuk with God's name. In other words, if you say a complete pasuk, you're allowed to use Hashem's name. You don't have to say the word Hashem. You could use Hashem's name the way we say it in Abraham. So Hashem ha'alitza min she'ol nafshi, you picked up my nefesh, you picked up my soul, my emotions, my life force from a very low place. And even if you're in that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat this again because I want you to understand this. Even if Hashem didn't pick you up yet, you're still in that low place. Say these words. Even if Hashem hasn't healed you yet, say these words, Hashem, you healed me. You're the source of all healing. Even if Hashem hasn't helped you yet, Say these words, Hashem, you help me, you're the source of all helping. And Hashem, you have given me life, you have enlivened me, you have preserved me. Again, the word chitani is one of those beautiful words that it means life, but it means also you gave me life. You've enlivened me. And I didn't fall down into the bar. Again, the bar means the grave, the pit, the lowest places, the depressed places, the sad places, the messed up places, the lonely places. If you're in any of those places, say this person. Say it again and again and again and recognize that really Hashem is with us. Really, we don't need anything but Hashem to be with us. And Hashem is always with us. People come and go. People in our life come and go. Hashem doesn't go. He's always here. I remember when my father, he should rest in peace, passed away. And um, my mother was alone. It was very, very surprising. He was, he, you know, it was surprising for we were on, it was unexpected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, and I was still living in America then. My mother still had her apartment and I still lived in our house and whatever it was until we, until we were able to merge households. Um, I remember once, and I used to want her to come to me every Shabbos and every Yantif and every day and every everything. So, and she didn't always want to come to Shabbos. So I said, mommy, aren't you lonely? And she said, no. Aren't you alone? Aren't you feeling alone in the house? Like, she said, I miss daddy. But, and she said this in complete sincerity and to you, but Hashem is with me all the time. So I feel daddy's presence here and I feel Hashem is with me, so I'm okay. And my mother, she should rest in peace. She was not a famous Rebison. She wasn't a big teacher. She was just a very, very strong, healthy, believing Jewish mother. It's basically the same. It's different words because we have that, Ellen. Thank you for pointing it out. The Gemara says it's the same word. Remember, we learned in Tehillim that David Melch repeats in different words the same concept because he wants us to internalize it. Whenever he repeats, it's because it's, he's telling us this is an important idea. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Just like we are with our kids. I told you 10,000 times and I'll say it again until you get it into your head. So he just says it in different ways in different words. Same word, Sha'ol, the same word, Bor. Okay, so Hashem, you gave me life. I didn't fall into the pits of despair. I didn't fall into the lowest, lowest places. And if you're in those lowest, lowest places, say the Pasuk and say, Hashem, I'm saying this Pasuk. David HaMelech, our famous, precious David, who's going to be Mashiach, he also felt these words. He also felt sometimes despair. And Sha'ol, how do we know? Because it says here, Hashem, you lifted me from hell. What does that mean? It means I was there. And you picked me up. You lifted me from the bar, from the lowest pits. What does that mean? It means I was there. So David Melch is saying to us, yes, I also felt those feelings. I also felt those scary, abandoned, or low, or overwhelming, or distant from Hashem feelings. And Hashem, you picked me up. Okay, so now, now we're into one of our famous, I told you that this is a parak of film for words. The word yordi, okay? So now that's, you see that there's an extra vav there. So again, if you have a regular tehillim 
like uh, I, I'm just looking at my tehillim now, but sometimes the tehillims that are just published for you to read will only will only have the the way that you read the word. But here, the the ktiv and the kri, the the kri is miyordi with a comments underneath the yud and the ktiv is with a vav there so it's it's pronounced a little bit the same actually if you were if you were um, israeli and you saw that word printed you would read it miyardi because underneath the yud there's an a sound we call it it's a comma so we call it an a sound which sounds a little bit like an o sound but the way you really say it is miyardi, bit more. But you could say miyardi, but so here you have an extra vav there, the kri and the ktiv. Chazal tell us that the, that you can read this miyardi. Me your day, Bor. I wish I had my, my uh, I wish I had uh, written this to you. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to figure out how to do that one day. I'm sure they can, I'm sure there's a way to do that. So you save me, me your day, Bor. We read it, me your day, Bor, from my falling into the pit. But you save me, me your day, Bor, from those who will eventually fall into the pit. In other words, the enemies of the Jewish people, the enemies of Hashem, the enemies of goodness, the enemies of honesty. Um, no, yeah, no, it's not. It's because of the vav, the extra vav there. Uh, the enemies of Hashem will eventually perish. They're going to eventually be destroyed. How that's going to happen, you know, stay alive and stay from and hold on. Let's just watch this movie as it's unfolding for us. How it's going to happen, I have no idea. As you see, Hashem, without shooting a bullet, Hashem allowed the state of Israel to make a certain kind of a peace agreement with many countries that used to be against us without anything, nothing happened. Just people began to talk. What happened? What was the difference between these peace agreements and all the past? The difference is that people began to talk honestly. Again, as I said, President Trump said, I'm not gonna to listen to all the same old, same old. That hasn't helped ever. In the last 72 years, everyone's been saying their same side of the argument. Let's have a different conversation. That's how Jared Kushner described what his first success was. Let's have a different conversation with different people who are willing to talk with us. You see the power of just humans interacting and talking? It turns the whole world upside down. In America, one of the reasons that President Trump is having such a hard time reclaiming his presidency is because the courts refuse to listen to his arguments. They refuse to let him talk. And the reason that so many Americans voted for the opposition to President Trump is because the newspapers refuse to talk honestly, refuse to, con to communicate honestly. So communication, honest communication creates peace. Dishonest communication creates war or lack of communication creates war. I'm dealing with a couple now, they should all be blessed. You know, I, I, they, you know, they have, they're going through a little bit of a difficulty in their marriage. And um, my first, I, I once said to the, the wife, I said, I just wish that I could get the two of you in a room with a third party and lock the door. And just, let's talk. Let's just, you say everything and he'll say everything and the third party will moderate. And then you're gonna say back and he'll say back and the third party will moderate. Just keep talking till you get everything cleared up. But people don't do that. People don't do that. They don't communicate till the very, very last drop. And that's why there's oftentimes machlokas because Healthy communication. We are, the whole book of Tehillim is David's communication to God, but also his communication to the Jewish people and ultimately to the world of how we should, how we should be and how we should 
consistently express ourselves. And of course, because nobody's safe, everybody's afraid and all of it, that's why communication doesn't happen because people are afraid. But if we can have safety, communication, that's the source of all blessings is safe communication, where you're not gonna take revenge on me if I say what I feel. And I won't take revenge on you if you say what you feel. And then I'll ask you, really, you really feel that way? And you'll ask me, why do you feel that way? And I'll explain to you. Thank you, Mary. They're there for a reason. There's a special reason that I put them there. Because we learned about flowers last week, right? In, in uh, Shabbos. We learned about flowers in Shabbos. Okay. Ladies, I'm going to wish you a good Shabbos. And um, I'll see you guys around Hashem next week. Now, next week is Erev Hanukkah. And we're going to continue with this parak of Hanukkah. We're going to continue with this parak of 30, number 30. Um, well, can, I, can I just tell you something? Um, the Shabbos project this year um, came out with an idea to actually send flowers to people for Shabbos. For Shabbos. So the truth is, you know, when you think about spending money on flowers, you think actually most people need um, chicken, right, more than they need their flowers. So I can't say that I jumped at the excitement of it, but I, I told them in a meeting, we had a very small closed meeting with a bunch of people from all over the world, and I told them about what you taught us last week. So because of that, I've changed my mind about the chicken and rather put the flowers. So um, thank you from, from the Shabbos Project, World Project, which will hopefully Mashiach will be here, but we'll be sending flowers really all over the world. They sent out 34,000 people received uh, messages from people with a small bunch of flowers. Wow, wow. But you have to explain it to right. Sorry, you have to explain. I, why tried, you... I did explain a little bit. I gave them a very short um, little, I said, but you had to explain it better. When you send out the flowers, there has to yes. be something. Yes, I said it has to be written with a letter about why flowers and why Mashiach. So we'll get you to write that for us. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Is this okay. year next week? Sorry. Sorry, yes. I had to go. Is this so year next week? Yes. yes. So week, Please, thank God. Thank you. Love okay. it. So much. Um, Have a wonderful week. We can share on Thursday of also. Thank yes, and we can share also. No yeah. problem. We don't, we don't need to take off. No reason to take off. And um, you say that, and I, let me just put in a thing here. Let's say you want to say to Hillen for someone. I'm going to not say that question. Who, what do you say if you want to say to Hillen for somebody? So one of the best ways is to say the Hillen for their age. So if a person is, let's say, 40 years old, then you say to Hillen 41, because they're really into their 41st year of life. So that's how you choose which Hillen to say for someone. Also say the ones that are meaningful to you, the ones that you like, the short ones. That's the ones that you would say for someone. For somebody's healing, you could say this one, you could say 20, number 20, you could say number six. Any, you can't go wrong saying to Helen. You can't go wrong, you can only do it right. Okay, there's my alarm went off. I've got can I just clarify the age of the person who's not well? I, I know somebody unfortunately is very not well. I should find out his age and say that to Helen for him? Yes. But if you can't find out the age, and don't make a big deal about it, if it's hard to find out the age, then just say anything, you know, any to him. Is there, you could say it anytime you want. Mm -hmm. Him could be said any time of the day or night, whenever it's convenient for you, just not in the bathroom. Otherwise, and, you hear, and the Yehirot son as well is also not limited to time? Same thing. Nothing is limited to time. The Yehirot son only on Shabbos, it changes. Yeah, yeah, but I like to start it with you here at some. For some reason, I thought it was only in the morning you should do that in, or during the day, but it doesn't matter, you're saying. You can say to Helen, you can only do it right. You can't do it wrong. You can do it 